continue to be presumptive Democratic nominee until the all the uh, superdelegate votes are in. But it's clear that uh, she will be the Democratic nominee to take on the uh, the Trumposaurus. And uh, so now we I think we can sort of segue from speculating about the political environment to actually what uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, proposal looks like, healthcare proposal, as opposed to Donald Trump. So um, there was a, uh, I think, a very good post um, in uh, Fast Times, or uh, article in, in Fast Company, rather, um, uh, that, that you noted, uh, David, about the, the issues inherent, and let's dispose of Donald Trump pretty soon. He's going to have something that's great and huge, and it's going to get rid of Obamacare, and everything is going to be wonderful, and we're going to buy insurance across state lines, and um, the lions will lie down with the lambs, and all will be wonderful. If I'm sounding cynical, it's because there's much to be cynical about with uh, uh, the Republican nominee, presumptive nominee. Um, Clinton's proposal is, not surprisingly, uh, a rather more uh, in-depth and detailed and thorough and well-reasoned. Um, however, there are still concerns with it, as, of course, there, there would be with anything that hasn't been fully fleshed out. I think that the couple of interesting things about her proposal is, number one, she wants to allow states to opt in to Medicaid and give them a guaranteed three years at 100% funding for, from the feds, um, which is a, a clearly an effort to get more states to um, increase uh, Medicaid enrollment. And the states that haven't yet, uh, we will see if that's a, enough financial incentive for, for them to do so. But uh, it appears that states are, even Florida is sort of wising up eventually saying, gosh, we really need to enroll in this because our hospitals are getting crushed. Nebraska is another one, Oklahoma a third. So hopefully that, uh, if, if uh, Secretary Clinton is elected and, and has the ability to get that through Congress, I think that will be, that will have a significant effect. Um, the other is the uh, public option where she's talking about a Medicare for all potential option. And I think that has certainly some appeal for those of us unlike Louise, who are in the latter stages of our life, uh, that uh, certainly um, got my attention. Um, the deductibles and co-pays that were subjected to in the private market um, seem to be a little bit less onerous in Medicare, so that's, that's certainly strong. And I would just uh, sort of juxtapose that um, against uh, a post that was, uh, I think, a first-time contributor, Rob Cullen, who was talking about the O'Malley plan, and shame on me, I should have realized that. The Medicare Essential Plan is, is really intriguing. It sort of gets rid of the Medicare A, B, C, D, and I don't know, whatever other alphabet, alphabetized numbers, <laughs> they, numbers they have, and consolidates into Medicare Essential, uh, which makes a huge amount of sense. So uh, hopefully uh, O'Malley's plan, which has a number of other attributes, not the least of which is it doesn't cost any money, and it's going to save, it's going to reduce healthcare spending by about uh, 180, $180 billion. And it's also going to maximize um, out of pocket costs um, as opposed to the traditional Medicare A, B, C, D deductibles, um, so which is going to be, I think, a, a big help for uh, many seniors as well. So there's an awful lot of reasons for the Medicare Essential to be part of any. Uh, any legislative effort that, that happens next year, and, and hopefully Clinton will will uh, adopt that, and we'll see what if that gains traction. Um, it'll be very interesting, Captain Obvious reporting for duty here, to see how in the debates, to the extent there are any, um, that uh, Trump and Clinton talk about health care. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. That's just going to be fascinating. So. Those are the sort of two very closely related posts that, that really caught my eye and probably mostly due to the, the presumptive nominees being nailed down at this sure. point. Sure, sure, yeah. I think, I think I, one I, of the... Go ahead. I was going to say, I think another part of Clinton's plan that, or one, you know, she's proposed a lot of different things, but something that really stood out to me was the idea of capping everyone's premium at 8.5% of their income, regardless of their income. And... You know, that catches my attention because we do have a, you know, a section of Colorado that faces a pretty significant subsidy cliff. Um, the front range is pretty affordable, but if you're in the mountains, health insurance premiums are astronomical. And, um, you know, if, you're, if your income is obviously up to 400% of the poverty level, you're 
you're you're good because you're covered by subsidies. But if you're at 410 percent of the poverty level, or even you know, we've run the numbers for people all the way up to 600 percent of the poverty level, they can be easily spending. You know, depending on their age, they can easily be spending 15 or more percent of their income on health insurance, even at that high of a level of income. And so, you know, obviously, if you're, you know, earning millions of dollars, it's not going to matter anyway, because your health insurance isn't going to cost more than eight and a half percent of your income. But I think that for that segment of the population, and we deal with a lot of people, a lot of our clients are in that situation where their income is a little over 400 percent of the poverty level. But to be spending $20,000 a year on their family's health insurance when they're earning, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year is a pretty a pretty big lift so so louise that segues nicely into your post this week about a uh, proposed uh, 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 statewide level um, um, premium setting if i've got it right uh, that's right. been proposed in colorado and uh, wondering how that would affect some of the clients that you described and also if you have a sense of uh, where that stands in terms of uh, viability or implementation? Well, I think, I mean, obviously it would, it would very much help those, those people that I'm talking about because it would, it would spread the, obviously the bulk of our population in Colorado is along the front range. And that's where the health insurance premiums are the most reasonable. Um, when you get out on the Eastern Plains, they're higher than they are here along the front range, but not as high as they are in the mountains. When you get up to the mountains, they are just really, really high. And Rocky Mountain Health Plans has indicated that they, or has said that they are pulling out of the individual market in basically everywhere except Mesa County in Colorado. So our mountain regions, Kaiser Permanente expanded into some of the mountain regions, but sort of the more heavily populated um, areas. It's going to base it, Rocky Mountain Health Plans exit is going to basically leave most of the Colorado mountains with just um, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield as their only choice in the exchange. And in, in, well, it depends on where you are, but basically that's the gist of it. And then mm -hmm. you end up with, they're also, Anthem is dropping their PPOs um, in the individual market here too at the end of this year. So people are going to be having, you know, in some areas, just an Anthem HMO as their only choice. And it's expensive. It's really expensive up there because there aren't that many doctors. The population is more spread out. Um, the insurance companies don't have as much bargaining power with the doctors, and so and everything's more expensive up there. There's, you know, your real estate sure. costs, the overhead for the doctors. Obviously, if you're in Vail, is a whole lot more than if you're in Denver. Um, right. And there's definitely differing viewpoints on that. I think before we can have any sort of realistic discussion about it. We have to wait and see what the um, Department of Insurance comes up with. They're working on it right now and they will have a report to the legislature by August of this, you know, this summer. So this is going to be happening over the next couple months. Um, basically what they're coming up with is, is how is this going to impact us? You know, is it going to raise rates down here on the front range by 2% or is it going to raise rates on the front range by 20%? I mean, I think that before we can say really how we feel about this, I think people need hard numbers in front of them. Um, Jared Polis is our, you know, one of our um, congressional representatives and he represents the mountain communities and he's really been pushing for this for, for the last few years. And I would also say this is not new with the ACA. Um, we've been in the health insurance industry in Colorado since 2002 and the mountains have always been more expensive and had fewer options. So, you know, it's, it's not new. The subsidies actually have made it more affordable for people with modest, you know, right. low and middle incomes right. in Colorado, mm -hmm. up in the mountains. But have you seen this? Have you seen this sort of uh, change run through other states and um, sort of the equalization of uh, of premiums in this way? You know, I'm not familiar with if there's any other states that have done a, just one single rating area. Um, I know that Colorado is sort of stands out as one of the more significant states in terms of having such a wide range of premiums right. Um, right. In, in a relatively short distance. I mean, you know, you from Denver, you go an hour and a half into the mountains and your premiums are hugely different. It's not a, it's not a gradual change at all. Um, so no, I'm not familiar with if other states have done, have made yeah. as drastic right. a step as I know this. They're different, they're different markets in Massachusetts, uh, east to west, but uh, I imagine the, the differentials are not as great. 
Right. And I know, you know, some like Wyoming and Alaska have astronomical rates all across their whole state. Sure. There's not much they could do. You know, they've considered, you know, blending their individual and small group markets into one rating pool, um, things like that. But Colorado has sort of a unique is uniquely positioned in terms of having reasonable rates for a large chunk of the population and what a lot of people would consider unreasonable rates for a relatively small chunk of the population. So we are in somewhat of a unique position to be able to do that. You know, it wouldn't help Wyoming to make the whole state one rating area. I don't know whether actually whether they are or not, but it wouldn't really help them because they don't have an area of the state that's low priced versus an area that's high priced. Louise, question. Given uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, potential uh, to, or her, her suggestion to have a Medicare for all, do you have any speculation on what that would do? It, it might offer an alternative to the other rating organizations. Do you have a sense for that or, or other rate? Uh, you offer more choice to the folks who, who are not in the in the, the major metro area. What's your take on that? Oh, absolutely. It would. And if I'm understanding correct, I believe she was proposing for people 55 and older. Right. Right. Okay. So, you know, obviously that's the population that is most impacted by the subsidy cliff, you know, the problems we've been talking about here. I think that that would be a really popular idea depending on, you know, all the other pieces that would have to fit together. Would they be able to buy into Medigap, guaranteed issue, you know, what sort of pricing would they be looking at on those sort of things? Would would Medicare Advantage be available? There's a, there's a range of questions. I also think, um, you know, realistically, would this would Congress would this get through Congress? Would her proposal get through Congress? And if so, how long would it take? Um, you know, when we look at the ACA was uh, passed in 2010, and you know most of the changes came about in 2014. We could even if you know Secretary Clinton gets elected and say this does work out, it could be several years down the road. Right. Um, and so I think oh, that for sure. some of these people in the in the mountain communities in Colorado, you know, they're thinking you know, am I going to wait till 2025 for this? You know, how is this actually going to work? And so the, with the changing the rating areas, it does seem like Colorado is moving, moving relatively fast in terms of the preliminary parts on this, because they did make it so that, um, I mean, the the law was just signed into, the bill was signed into law, I believe in April and the report is due to the legislature by August. So they're gathering information quickly and it's possible if they decide that this is doable, that they could be, implementing a single rating area for 2018. I mean, I have no idea what process they're gonna move with this, but I do think that if they do it, um, it would definitely be something that would come on board before any changes in terms of Medicare for all or anything like that. Yeah, it just strikes me that given the uh, political environment, and obviously we're, I'm speculating on a, on a very shaky foundation here, but um, if uh, Trump continues to crater and cause himself a lot of problems, especially out in your area, Louise, where he's managing to antagonize a large percentage of the voting potential voting population. I think he's doing that everywhere. <laughs> yeah, except it, except for us old white guys. I don't know what it That's is. We, we're just special people. We, we, we just love it. Not all of us, but some of us. So the, what strikes me is that one of the, I think, justifiable complaints about the Obama administration is they were looking to build consensus and they were trying to get the GOP on board, and that's why they got rid of the public option, and they did a bunch of other things to, to try to get Susan Collins or somebody, one of the GOP folks, to sign on. Obviously, that was a, a, a fruitless venture. So would Clinton, and potentially if, if Trump is able to drag down some of the GOP uh, electorate with him, then would have, maybe Clinton will have learned a lesson from Obama and make something happen that is sort of purely democratic that would a democratic initiative that would really try to get this public option out there, increase the choice, put more pressure on those jurisdictions or on those rating areas where there's only one entity. So, uh, you know, ever the optimist, uh, Pollyanna here, you know, my hope is that if she does get elected, she has the uh, incentive motivation and political uh, drive to get something, make something happen quickly that way to potentially solve a problem with affordable care that may drag down the Democratic Party in the, in the next midterm election. So I recognize I'm speculating on top of speculating here, but my, my hope is that if, some, if Clinton does get elected and if she has long coattails, that they will actually move.
move relatively quickly to make something happen and learn a lesson from Obama. That could definitely well, I think be. The, the, the coattails are key, Joe, because I mean, without, without that happening, whatever she says or does will be limited to what can be uh, um, managed through regulatory change or executive order, sure. uh, sort of a tall order. Um, and maybe there is the momentum sort of backlash against Trump to result in uh, longer coattails for the Democrats this time around. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's certainly not a done deal. I, I wanted to jump in sort of a, on, a, on a tangent to one of, one of the things that you mentioned about the uh, Clinton plan as highlighted in that Fast Company piece, uh, specifically the Medicaid expansion. And I think that we still have significant opposition to Medicaid expansion in the states it was after all the states that uh, that sort of jumped on board to to bring suit against the federal government in connection with that piece of the legislation and um i think for many states even those who are not necessarily firmly ideologically opposed to ever expanding medicaid with uh, at no cost with money being pumped in from the federal government uh, the issue is the uh, quote unquote woodwork effect. Yeah. Any sort of Medicaid expansion project requires uh, a public education effort. And the work issue is people come out of the woodwork who were eligible for traditional. Sorry, go ahead. Medicaid, 100% by the federal government. So that ends up being a significant cost to the state and one that uh, many simply do not want to face. And so I, I'm a little puzzled about the woodwork issue. Essentially what we're saying is we have this program, it's available to people, but we don't want people to use it and costs will go up because people are using a program that we've set up to help these people. So I understand from a financial perspective that people make that argument. Um, but I think it's it's uh, I don't know, it's not disingenuous. It's 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 problematic because essentially it says we passed this program, but we don't want you to use it. Well, then why in the heck did you pass the program to begin with? So I I understand the the financial ramification. No, I, I I don't disagree, but there's right. uh, there ends up being a significant cost when you start uh, promoting a, a Medicaid expansion. Uh, you know, the folks show up who are eligible for the base right. program. Right. And the federal dollars aren't there to offer an additional subsidy, so it's it's a concern for yeah. for uh, state and local government. I, I think um, you know from what we're hearing, that's going on in Florida, um, Nebraska, Oklahoma. The healthcare providers who are having, especially health healthcare systems, hospitals who have to deliver care to these these uninsured folks. Um, they're the ones who are actually signing these people up for Medicaid as they need to because they, right. they want to get paid something. So my right. take is that the political winds are sort of going to uh, force Medicaid adoption and the, the entities that are getting really hurt by this, which are the hospitals and healthcare systems who are now acting as the caregivers for uninsured, are going to have to get a lot more um, effective at, at enrolling people. So. And they will enroll people in Medicaid who are already incurring claims, um, as opposed to enrolling people in Medicaid that um, have yet to incur claims. So that's so disproportionately, I think they're they're going to be more expensive. But right. Medicaid is a big part of the expansion, and I expect other states are going to have to adopt it. Yeah. I think also when you look at the numbers. Um, the amount of money that flows into a state for with Medicaid expansion by far outweighs the additional costs the state has to pay in, you know, for the woodworkers. And so when you if you look if you look just at the state's Medicaid expenditures, obviously, yes, the adding people to the rolls increases the state's Medicaid expenditures, both woodworkers and um after this year uh, expansion folks. But when you look at the whole picture and there's been several states have commissioned studies where they've had, you know, look at the overall picture, the amount that they're paying for uncompensated care for hospitals, especially since the disproportionate hospital share payments are drying up from the federal government. Right. It's, 
the I don't think I've seen a single state yet where the numbers haven't worked out in their favor if you look at the big picture. So I think it's a matter of looking beyond just what the state is spending on Medicaid and looking at what the state is spending on health care in overall, you know, sort of taking a little from column A and putting it in column B. Um, but there's definitely still ideological opposition that goes that runs deeper than that. Okay. All right. Um, let's uh, let's move on. One one another post uh, that I highlighted this week. I was happy to be able to host this edition of Health Want Review. Was a post about star rating systems and to by provider organizations. This time around, specifically the American Hospital Association, and we've also seen this all the time in many different uh, situations and circumstances. Provider organizations may uh, you know, pay some lip service and, and see the value of having some sort of rating systems in place for their services, but ultimately uh, there's an interest in uh, uh, you know, what we refer to generally as regulatory capture by the regulated community. Um, people want to make sure that uh, even a negative rating will somehow put the provider organization in a reasonably good light. And there's certain disclaimers on the uh, rating website, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this time around, there's an issue with um, uh, Medicare star rating for hospitals and the American Hospital Association weighing in on this front. Um, these rating systems obviously have an effect on compensation under Medicare and under, uh, from other payers as well. Mm -hmm. And also just in terms of reputation as, as uh, uh, the government and other uh, organizations roll out better and better websites that are more and more accessible to consumers, people will search to the extent that they're dealing with um, um, elective procedures they will search based on star ratings, et cetera. Uh, so uh, it's just another chapter in the in this long running dance uh, around ratings and the regulated communities' reaction to them. Just a couple of quick points on that. Uh, I think we talked about this last uh, in the last edition or two editions ago, last time I was on. And we were discussing the whole issue of ratings and how uh, consumers really aren't using them extensively at this point. They're quite confusing, et cetera. And I guess my take is that we're going to be going to evolve to a much better place. Um, it's just it's pretty ugly as we all watch the the process that the healthcare industry goes through while we evolve there. And what's um, uh, potentially problematic is all the efforts that, or, or almost all the efforts that I've seen by other or, by organizations to put in place some sort of rating cards, report cards, performance indicators, whatever. Typically, the local medical society, hospital association, caregiver organization always comes out with complaints and problems about that specific card. And I hope at some point these uh, advocacy organizations actually decide that they need to participate in this as positive actors and not just complaining about um, everything that occurs because by definition, some people are gonna be great, some people are gonna be really bad and there's gonna be a whole bunch of folks in the middle. But these provider organizations have to get involved in this and not just complain, bitch and moan about this isn't fair, et cetera. They also have to recognize that some of their members are good, some are bad and most of them are kind of in the middle. Not everybody's going to be a number one, and and that's just a fact of life. So, without the participation of these provider associations, provider communities, advocacy organizations, I think it's going to take us far too long to get to where we need to be, and where we end up isn't going to be as as uh, good a place as as it would if they actually participated. Louise, is there much going on in in Colorado from a sort of a state? rating perspective or a separate question when you talk to your uh to your customers your policyholder customers uh, is there much interest at all in in sort of rating providers and, and getting access to that kind of information 
I would say not the primary questions we get from people is can I keep my doctor? You know, people tend to be inertia is a pretty powerful force, I think, in healthcare. And so from an individual consumer perspective, right. um, people tend to be basically we have two groups. We have the perfectly healthy people who say, Hey, sign me up for Kaiser, it's the cheapest option. I don't even know who my doctor is at this point because I haven't been in years and it's all good. And then you have the population where people have pre-existing conditions and they're, they have a current healthcare team and their biggest priority is keeping that team. And so, you know, there's, and which I would say that is probably a big part of the reason um, Anthem is doing away with their PPO because that's where everyone was gravitating who had those concerns. So, I, you know, I don't think nearly as much people are concerned with the, the ratings of these providers as they are with just sticking with what they know. Yeah. Um, so, and people who don't, yeah. um, honestly, people who don't have an established relationship with, with a medical team are by far and away more concerned with premiums. And again, the ever increasing premiums every year, it's motivating. I mean, Kaiser has the lion's share of the market share in the exchange, you know, the majority of our consumers have gone with Kaiser just because they're so much less expensive than the other options, even though their network is, you know, is very limited. People don't mind because they want to lower premiums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, a question from a viewer about uh, ratings. You know, what 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 do ratings do in the marketplace? Uh, will will ratings uh, mean that hospitals work harder to get a higher rating? Or does it mean that insurance companies will uh, uh, look to work with lower rated um, providers? Perhaps, uh, I guess, perhaps the intent is in order to get lower rates. Um, so my, my sense, just following up what you're saying, Joe, is that, uh, you know, we always live in, you know, uh, it's 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 Lake Wobegon everywhere, you know, where everybody is above average, right? right. Um, the the uh, nobody wants to be seen as average or below average, and the problem is has led to a, a proliferation of measures in so many parts of healthcare. My 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 thinking has always been: I'd love to see a handful of meta measures that would really allow us to. To determine quality uh, across the board, but I don't know if we'll ever get there. Meanwhile, we have a million different measures that we track, and uh, star ratings or other sorts of ratings. My concern with these rating systems is that it drives an organization, whether it's a payer or a provider organization, to focus on the handful of things that are going to drive the rating. So right. There, whether it's six measures or 35 or 44, whatever it is, um, that's what's going to be focused on and other things fall off the table. And that's sort of a perennial concern. Yeah, it, 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 it sort of, I think Louise's point's a great one, which is, you know, are we spending an awful lot of time working on something that nobody cares about? If people are picking their health plans based on, is my doctor in it? Or if I don't have a doctor, is it cheap? Then... Why are we spending all this time, energy, and money? That's, I think, a very valid question. And I, I guess my quick answer to Roxanne's uh, question would be, uh, I think hospitals that have a low rating will work hard to obfuscate and uh, decry their rating and um, say that those are the damn insurance companies and this is unfair and, and they won't work harder to- patients are different. Yeah, uh, yeah, case mix adjustment. Yeah, 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 yeah. so. Mm -hmm. Well, New Jersey has the there's a whole big brouhaha going on in New Jersey right. over the Omnia plans, right. um, and so and I think there I can see both sides of that. Basically, the the carrier sort of apparently blindsided the hospitals. They found out along with everybody else basically who was in tier one and who was in tier two, and if you're in tier one, you know. If you're if a patient goes to a tier one hospital, they get lower cost sharing. So, of course, everybody's going to want to go to the tier one hospitals. And the result, you know, the tier two hospitals basically said, hey, 
you know, we didn't get a say in this. We don't know what metrics were used to determine this. And it's, I mean, it's resulted in legislation. There were several pieces of legislation introduced this year or two to call for, and some of it really makes sense. You know, there should definitely be transparency if, if insurers are going to use multi-tier networks. There needs to be transparency in terms of how they decide, you know, so that just so that consumers know that it's not that, you know, Bob who runs Hospital A is married to, you know, the cousin of the health insurer's CEO. You know, you do need transparency there so that people know what metrics were used to, to place insurers in what category. But um, on the end, you know, the, the, the insurer has claimed that it's just cost and efficiency and patient outcomes, which, if that's true, are things that obviously we would not want because you want the best of both worlds there in terms of the most efficient bang for your buck, but also the best consumer outcomes. So, you know, at this point, I would say definitely more transparency is needed in terms of why insurers are making those decisions, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a bad idea to have insurers be able to limit whether to just set up your networks. It obviously caters to what people are looking for in terms of lower premiums, lower out-of-pocket costs. Right. Well, folks, we got a, a minute or so left. Any other quick other posts uh, that deserve a little attention today? Just a quick one, and that was uh, Jane Sorensen Cohn, or Khan, sorry, had a uh, interesting post about um, um, behavioral health costs. And one of the things that I picked out of it, um, my mom's 95, she suffers from dementia, she's in a dementia care facility, and it is wicked expensive. $350 a day um, and worth every penny. But uh, her point is that, uh, or one of the points in, in her terrific post is that behavioral health costs are going up and at a faster rate than cardiovascular uh, costs. And that could be in part because people are living longer because we're dealing with our cardiovascular issues. And therefore, now we have more dementia and other issues associated, you know, Alzheimer's, et cetera. So it really got me thinking about okay, so we're helping people physically, and now that's going to cost us more to deal with some of the behavioral health, mental health issues going forward. And I can clearly see that with my mom, who uh, I will now violate all HIPAA issues, is hypertensive and has been forever and doesn't take her meds and whatnot. But for we've been able to deal with the cardiovascular issues, and now we're dealing with a long-term chronic condition instead, which is going to have some significant impact across the whole that whole population. Right. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the sort of the explosion and the need for behavioral health services, I think, cuts across um, one or two of the other posts in this week's collection, which touched on telemedicine. And that's sort of a growing area for behavioral health, mm -hmm. um, something that wasn't seen maybe in the initial uh, spurt of, of telemedicine providers, but that's something that I think is, is being seen as a bigger and bigger issue that, that needs attention, needs resources. Agreed. Definitely. Well, great. Well, I see that we've come to the bottom of the hour once again, and uh, Louise and Joe, I thank you very much for participating in today's Blab. I'm glad uh, that we had some uh, folks following along at home and uh, sending us some comments and questions here today. This will be archived with the archives of Health Wonks on Blab. And please check us out at healthwonkreview.com for archives and future editions of the Blog Carnival and the Blab. Thank you very much and we'll see you next time. Thanks, David. Good to see you, Louise. Take care. Bye.